This is Dave Monkey for Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. It is April 24th, 2016. And as always, this is our weekly look at the area environment and pretty much anything else having to do with the area that uh, Dave is in the mood to talk about. Okay. It was last day, Friday. Uh, Sierra Club met at a uh, restaurant out in North Town and... Uh, they're talking about fly ash, uh, accumulated fly ash in Vermilion County. Uh, I was almost tempted to say that we're all of us on the verge of, of taking that fly ash and taking the silica aluminum out of that fly ash and making a con composition ties. I didn't really want to say too much because I think the research has a long way to go yet. But... Uh, there's a, often a, a situation where you can reuse the uh, waste materials that, in this case, are from mining and electrical generation and things like that. Uh, so uh, there was discussion about this coal in the southwest corner of Champaign County near Tahoma. Uh, but remember, every day is an Earth Day and it's nice to have a celebration once in a while, but uh, don't forget it. Every day, every hour, uh, we're involved with ecology, uh, environment, and uh, basic salvage uh, to see that the railroads run and the economy is there and in the process there's a sort of family of persons, a family of men including male and female men and uh, the, the uh, street has been alive this week with people who are part of uh, a family that uh, is associated with everything from Seven Saints to Mike and Molly's to uh, Weft and ERS and the storefront on the north end uh, adjacent to Taylor Street, which will eventually be a studio. Uh, it's just the, the, the interaction between people is important. This was a rather raunchy street at one stage, and it's changed to, to being a, a still a, a survival street. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, I went to a forest preserve meeting, but I looked on the website, and it said the meetings will sometimes be uh, out of town. They'll be uh, like at the Salt Fork facility or at Homer Lake. And uh, I went to the regular meeting place, which is at uh, Mohammed that I missed there. So I did enjoy looking at the forest growing with its uh, May apples up and uh, a whole bunch of other understory herbs interested. I went down to uh, the uh, Camp Creek area and where we often pick, pick seed, uh, Cyanosis, and the hoary pocoon was out in flower along with the golden alexander and starry-eyed grass. Uh, I actually drove my vehicle over some starry-eyed grass, not realizing, but uh, if, if people are really interested, I'll take them to show you, you those sorts of species that you don't usually see very often. Uh, they often are, are ephemeral. They don't, they're not there for a long time. Uh, I was really going to the Forest Preserve just to be there as a, a totem pole for prairie because I'm a little worried. We, when Hartland Pathways took out the 
interim trail use agreement with Surface Transportation Board and the uh, the Rail Banking Act, we very purposely looked at the preservation of remnant prairie along the corridor. And uh, uh, that has uh, morphed some into trail and uh, that puts it in a kind of a, a different category. We very much appreciated the fact that the rail bankers had uh, seen that bikers had been buying these railroad beds and using them and uh, on an interim trail basis they figured that they could save railroad beds by uh, supporting this activity in an interim manner so that so we we appreciate the the rail banking style the trail style and but the prairie needs to be there when you're down to 0.01 percent of the prairie that we have that's uh, uh, an important thing it, now by watching the logo the logo uh, for the trail uh, sports mainly a large bicycle uh, there's no there's a slash of green and a slash of blue to represent uh, vegetation and water a fairly big railroad line uh, and uh, no little thing like a sprig of uh, prairie blue stem or something like that to represent the prairie so uh, I was just going to see what was going on uh, and that I do a fair bit of just to be there. I don't intend to be there too often because then you get to be uh, typecast as uh, concerned and, and that's fair enough uh, when we're down to next to nothing and an endangered ecosystem then we do need to stand up and be counted. Uh, the little pocket prairie was doing wonders this week. It, it had a, a, a little fire there a while ago because someone put a cigarette butt in the leaves and bingo, we had a fire. And that's caused all sorts of av av avalanches that I might get into. But uh, I was showing someone who is a, a school teacher and uh, she and her husband had just been around the little prairie apropos not of me but by themselves and uh, I gave them a more formal field trip and uh, as we came out there were t uh, a couple of doves that uh, enjoy the sight. <laughs> Next day uh, Denise uh, Curio was coming to help uh, give the prairie a haircut and there was this Cooper's hawk uh, taking off with a dove. So this, this, so this is a real life. You, you, you have a little plot of prairie in downtown. You have cardinals. You have uh, uh, finches. You have a, a, a lot of activity. And uh, the understory herbs are growing. Uh, Trillium, uh, Solomon seal, uh, wild ginger is out in flower at the moment with a the russet little uh, you go look for it it's like a, a little russet tub uh, uh, and uh, I lost uh, bloodroot in one place but I find it's found its own place in a, a, a little distance away I have to wonder how it got there uh, perhaps a mouse or someone took the seed but <laughs> It's going in two or three places, so uh, that's kind of nice. And we haven't totally uh, removed the litter. I had four people that were out there enjoying the, the prairie, and uh, they helped me do some of the uh, Market Street side of the prairie. Uh, Denise and I were working on the uh, area under the sign. You have to remember that there were two 30-foot signs there and they were grandfathered in for 10 years and then uh, they had to go to a smaller size to meet the dictates of 
federal and state and local highway, which is University Avenue. And we sort of look over University Avenue. Uh, but we have had a lot of people who have visited there, not just because we had some small incident of a fire, but because they generally do, and they enjoy. And uh, you have to, uh, once again, stand up for this little pocket, which is uh, a controversial pocket because it's a, a, an attractive nuisance. You also have to deal with uh, homeless people and bar people and others who want to use the territory and sometimes are quite surprised that it has a, another use, a, a biological, bot botanical use. And we explain that the, the service berries are out in flower now and, and they form, form an edge timber where the animals would go out into the prairie and come back to nest and be protected in the, in the edge timber. Uh, we deal with the uh, fact that the, the little prairie there is a, is a, a sampler and uh, but it does have the structure of trees shrubs herbs and vines going through all those and so we have just the representation the compass plant and the dark are growing well i haven't seen the the uh, lead plant growing yet but the cup plants which are a little on the weedy side are taking over, so sometime we'll have to curtail their activity. But uh, they're interesting because they have this cup that collects water and, and sort of is a, an ecological monster that sits around the leaves of the cup plant. And they belong to the family of sylph sylphiums, which include the dock and uh, compass plant. And the story of the compass plant is interesting to people who don't realize it, it was uh, uh, used by early settlers who to d determine north and south, uh, where their brain would, after 100 miles, take you right back to where you started. And if you're in a, an atmosphere that uh, doesn't have anything that you can tie to, uh, so uh, there's other things in, in action. Uh, we have a f uh, Freedom Parade coming up. We've usually put a fairly heavy uh, trailer in there. It's getting to be that uh, it's uh, it. We need help for that uh, trailer. It's it, we have fairly big and expensive pictures of prairie and and the like uh, that go on the sides, but it, it requires a little bit of. Uh, oomph to get it together. So uh, think about that. I was just wondering whether we should not do it, but I think over the years people have gotten to expect that Heartland Pathways will be present in the parade. And usually I walk. I'm not sure I need to do that all the time, but it means that I get to talk to people. And uh, that's part of the, the, the family of of man, getting to know each other and know each other's interests. and uh, So I think we will once again be in the parade, and but we would like your help if you feel like being uh, helpful in that situation. You might want to give folks your phone number so that they can get a hold of you and make arrangements. 351-1911 or 840-1911. We had a visit from the city uh, maintenance and inspection. As a result of a small fire and a large fire engine and a lot of conflagration outside in the street, people were looking at our, our storefront. And first of all, there's, there's a little row of, of plants and planters and, and all sorts of things there that people sit on a... Uh, a stoop outside of our office and they look and see often things that have died. Uh, if if a, a ball of flowers uh, gets older and dies, it forms a, an interesting uh, image 
But you have to have a look to see. You have to be close to see that. And so this is not just a little mound of, of junk. This is, is something that has been enjoyed by the best part of, I, I would think, uh, perhaps a thousand people have, over the years, encountered that little mound of uh, uh, steel and have to make sure that it doesn't get stolen. But uh, it's there, and as the spring comes, the flowers came out, come out. I've been keeping flowers inside for winter, and they've come out, and uh, they're about to to get used to sunlight again, and uh, and so I'm watching them grow. You can hardly even see their buds at the moment, but they're there, and so that's a a fun situation. But that can be a, a violation of the city walk. walk. It, uh, and and the the fine for not getting rid of it and uh, uh, is seven hundred and fifty dollars. That's quite a, a, an amount. And in, you don't get to talk to people about what is there and explain it. Because, uh, the, the note comes to you, the legal document comes to you with that request on it, uh, 30 days, and you uh, get rid of this uh, narrow neck of the street. But I have a question. If, if you have things like... Uh, uh, billboards and they get grandfathered in for 10 years and you have all those people sitting out Parisian style where the city has decided to widen the sidewalks and make room for a tree here and there. Uh, what better than to have a small demonstration of ecology right outside our f front door? So I probably will uh, ask a question or two uh, uh, and hope that we get uh, to save our, our front stoop and the images behind the window. Often it includes flowers, uh, florists, the florists around the corner uh, often gives us flowers that are past their prime but they're still wonderful and we sometimes will put them in that uh, arrangement. Do you suppose one of the things you're running into with what you've got out in front is kind of the same thing that you run into with people looking at the prairie and thinking that it's just a bunch of weeds? To a lot of people, what you've got out in front may just look haphazard. You know why you put all of the different things there. Something that's yes. decaying is still attractive. To someone who's just walking by, that's a dead plant. So you're running into the exact same thing. And like you say, you need to actually talk to the people in charge and, and let them know, hey, look, what looks like a, a uh, stuff that should have been thrown away years ago. Here, here is the exact reason why all of this. It doesn't mean they're going to actually give in, and they're going to say, "Oh, well, never mind. leave it there. No problem." But at least you'll have had, you'll have well, talked to they, somebody. In kindness to them, they also have uh, generosity, but they also have uh, uh, restraints. So they they have to to uh, supervise the city, and you see it in Flint, Michigan, where city people have been accused of not doing the right job by uh, being loose about these sorts of things. So you have to, to understand that, that the person who brings you the, uh, Tim, who br brought the, the docket to me, uh, probably doesn't know that we've spent years trying to preserve a, a railroad bed through from Paris to Decatur or from... Maroa to Peoria, or and, and that we cover many, many counties, uh, and sometimes even the world. When we're thinking of doing things with India, for instance, I've been reading about Indians because I think we have a program that comes after us that is Indian, and and I, we should really have uh, some idea of the Indian continent. So, so uh, we have to at least stand up and say what we're doing. And I, I've been rather reluctant to do that. I, I, I'm a little bit shy about doing that. But in the last couple of years, I've decided that we have to be a totem pole for what we're thinking and doing. And that's a responsibility. I didn't get to go to the lobby sessions in, 
in Springfield that were associated with Earth Day. Uh, there's just too much to cover. And uh, so sometimes uh, we're involved in uh, uh, psychological challenges. Uh, even as I write my script for today's prairie, I'm doing battle with the computer because I do it as, as a sort of a, 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 a stream of consciousness. And there's a little thing that pops up and says, oh, that is the, it should have an E in it. <laughs> so I, I, I have my con uh, challenges. And Dave and I have been working with how to put together a thousand odd of uh, uh, contacts. Uh, some of them are on a, a cell phone and some of them are on a, on a, a uh, regular computer. So how do you merge? And we have to exercise our brains to do this. And be, we're very happy to have the computer support and the ability to uh, work with a banner of public television and and get some of this information up on YouTube. But then we have to know how to, to work with uh, Facebook. And so we have uh, uh, Kristen uh, Johns just did an early spring representation of the Pocket Prairie, and, and she knows how to get people to like that image that that video program it's only 10 minutes long but it's it helps but then we have to share that and then so other people put their uh, contacts in and very shortly within three days we had 120 contacts so we have to be more efficient at doing that and we've been working with weft and weft has been doing uh, archiving and david has been doing archiving and we've got uh, we're working with the Banner Free Library, and he's been working with Uncle Boss uh, to see that we get information over there. And, uh, I don't know. David, you might like to say just a little bit about that. Sure. Okay, well, um, folks may not know that the Banner Free Library includes um, an archival unit. They are a center that archives anything and everything that they can, they can get their hands on, it seems to me. Um, they've already archived a little bit of what Weft has Weft has uh, put out for quite a few years. We put out the Weft Review, and they have a pretty decent collection of them. Two school years ago, the um, U of I grad school library school program um, had a class on how to do archiving, and a group of three of their students picked Weft to be their their um, <laughs> their example. They basically came here, looked around to see what Weft had, and put together a very neat um, list of all of the things that we've got, including, for example, how many years of T-shirts does Weft have from all of the pledge drives that we've we've had. So, as Dave said, sometime last year, I started talking with Anka Voss to find out how would Weft start taking this vestigial um, idea of archiving and put it into something that a professional could really use. So I've been over there. We've gotten, I love databases. It's, it's been my profession for a long time to work with computers and software and designing databases are, that's in my blood from, from oh, 25 years ago and on to now. Um, so one of the things that I've done with Anka is to work out how could Weft put together its own simple database that tells you all the things that you need to know. Um, what is this thing? What's the date of it? You know, who designed it if it's a t-shirt? Who, who published it if it's the Weft Review? All of these other bits of information, because you never know. Someday someone want, may come in and say, I know you've got this guy on the radio, Ed Hadley. He does this really odd show early Sunday morning. He comes on at midnight. And, you know, what has he done for Weft? If you've got a database of all the things that we've got in their archived, you can type in Ed Hadley's name, and it will show you the T-shirts that he's designed, if he had anything to do with designing anything for the Weft Review. Was said that again? He has music there, too. That's right. And, and we could, um, from time to time, he is part of what's called the Noise Assembly. Most of the music that we have here at Weft, we couldn't actually archive because it's uh, owned by you know musicians and, and record labels. But every once in a while people from Weft get together and they just come in <laughs> again very late at night from midnight until they get really tired and they play guitars and, and synthesizers and all sorts of things like that. That sort of stuff could be archived along with t-shirts and all the other things that we've got upstairs. So that's what I've been doing. 
what Weft has 80 people on the air. Of those 80, a good 25 at least um, are pretty avid volunteers, and each of us brings something a bit different from what all the others here have. My specialty, again, is working with software and liking databases more than most people would ever want to be uh, involved with them. So this is where I can contribute something that I'm good at and, and probably no one else is going, to, is going to do. Although we do actually have one of the um, grad students still here with us. So she and I get to, to, to put some things together to figure out how to, how to get this archiving thing. And I'll also mention one other thing. Um, the university in the last few years has put together the Sousa archives where they're specifically archiving music. And it's not just from WEFT. It's, it's any live performances, as I understand it, and sheet music and bunches of other things. I don't know many of the details, but it, we're going to see if we can't also use them as an archival um, repository as well as the Abana Free Library. But I, I guess I should, I'll finish here by saying, again, if you ever are curious, how did Urbana and Champaign and even the area beyond that get to be the way it is, try going over to the Urbana Free Library. The archival unit is up on the second floor and it's it's pretty impressive and you might find very interesting stuff that you never would have expected to to run across. There was a library director, Neil Carpenter, who put together a lot of this sort of history. So this is a rather specialized library. Uh, there's another one in, in um, Indiana like it, but you can get a lot of county history, uh, uh, archival stuff that is not always uh, associated with, with small libraries. And uh, w uh, the next talent is to, is to be enable people to use that information. And that's where we get back to working with the maintenance situation, which is quite genuine. We went from the front uh, facade to to the where where over the years when this was a, a rotor graveyard or a, 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 a printing press background uh, organization called Grub Engraving, and they had eight buildings, one of which is Weft, and we were here very early, even before Weft, uh, to uh, try and fill in what was at that time. Uh, a dead central business district. The engraving had been, uh, or the linotype uh, had gone by the board. The uh, various other printing procedures had gone, and uh, the engravers were moving out. And it would seem that if we could rent uh, buildings fairly inexpensively and contribute to the dead central business situation that existed when everyone ran off to the malls. So these four buildings were empty, and we actually applied to the Coca Foundation to see if we could get four uh, non-profit agencies in here. And we more or less did. Uh, WEFT came to, to uh, where we are now, and uh, we were already there. And then Mark Rubel brought a studio, uh, recording, a sound studio, to the... Uh, 1117. So we were at 115, and WEFT is at 113, and then there were uh, other people in uh, the 111 next to Mike and Molly's. And so th that we, we have contributed to uh, the upgrade of downtown some, and we're kind of alternative. It It's not your gentrification territory. This is not a $9 million uh, high rise. Uh, but we figure that the things that we do are the sort of things that make a city valuable. This is why people tromp off to Chicago and New York, because they find interesting things happening. And Champaign is not so big that uh, you get lost in it. But it is, has a marvelous collection of music people and other people who have uh, talents that you can't believe, and you share them uh, if the talent is to know how to share them. It started off with things like Plato and, and uh, very simple uh, compared with today's Internet. But uh, the Internet is there, is helpful. It's a tool like everything else. 
but wow, it is an interesting tool, and we can use it. Uh, then how do we do that on a shoestring without the, the money to, for instance, uh, put in a, uh, a window or uh, explain what we do with pots of plants in the street when they're sort of, a, a, in a way, a memorial to someone who got uh, who died in the street uh, after wanting to to do s something that the administration didn't want to do in a bar, and and he actually died after having just gotten his PhD. So we put these things here for purposefully, <coughs> but, but we don't expect a new generation of city people to automatically know that there's a, a lot of work behind this and a lot of thought. So but that's probably en enough. We did go to the back of the building where a pane of glass has fallen out and legitimately we have to do something about that. So there's, there's a, a, an appropriateness of this request for us to do things. It's a little bit after half past, so it's a good time to bop, pop on the air again. Mention, you're listening to WEFT Champagne 90.1 FM. This is The Prairie Monk, which is our one hour a week to tell you stuff that's going on in Champaign-Urbana with an emphasis on the natural world. Uh, oh, and it's also April 24th. We, we encourage a family of friends. Uh, and so interesting, in the last week or Last month, there's been journalists that have come through, two journalists, the students that have been doing things with us. Uh, there's been uh, uh, an artist who is wanting to map some of our territory uh, in, a, in an artistic manner. Uh, there's just been a, a welter of people who have come and, and, and visited, and th that, that gives us some... Uh, encouragement to continue our activities. We've also salvaged a lot of things, and and there is a huge set on shortly in, with the Humane Society. It uh, is in the fairgrounds, and we announce these sorts of things, uh, and we look at them from a salvage point of view. You can't always go back three days later and get what you saw. At a, at a garage sale, so the, the the agencies like the Salvation Army and the Goodwill, you can go back. You can decide that you want to make a, a movie and you need these sort of sets, and you can go get clothing or shoes or whatever you might want. So we're very encouraging of that. And this week we move things. I will have one set of uh, plastic covers that go around a a, a quart jar and seal the jar so it's known as not whatever product it has not been defiled by somebody opening it. Uh, I must have a thousand of those uh, plastic covers that you sort of uh, heat onto the, the bottle that you have. But I've tried several times to uh, pass them on to people who deal with food and without success. So they, that's the sort of thing where you have to say, there's a limit to it, I'm going to recycle these as, as plastic. And that's unfortunate. But Jason, who just came to bring us the, the video camera, just took uh, about 10 uh, CD spindles that he can use to store CDs. Uh, so just uh, that, that sort of thing goes on all the time. Uh, so Bill Smith was uh, Bill Smith has been a professor of recreation in Eastern Europe University. He's retired, but he's he's been on this village boy of Savoy for years. Uh, so Saturday morning I get a call from him. He's on his way to an antique show in in Kankakee, and we talked a lot about different things that we've jointly worked on for years. And so that is also part of the family of of man that he, uh, exists in, in this community. Uh, so I'm going to go to uh, Paris.
Decatur. Decatur. We have there a railroad line that was going to be bought by a, a sort of maverick uh, railroad organization, which wasn't exactly appreciated by uh, everyone else. It was, uh, you know, the everyone else is probably the railroad industry. It was an old Penn Central line, and at one stage this other agency had a, a, a train that was parked at one end of the line and it didn't have permission to go onto somebody else's line. So there was a little battle about who was going to buy this and who was going to use this and who was going to compete with him, whoever. But this line was absolutely loaded with prairie. It was in little pieces here and there and so I and we, this included a whole slug of people. Uh, the railroad runs from Paris to Brockton to Oakland to Hinesboro to uh, Kent to Arcola to Chesterville to Arthur. Uh, I have these down here somewhere. Where are they? Uh, and and it's it's a long uh, skinny area that goes uh, to uh, Lovington, uh, Heavy City, Zion, and Decatur. About fifty odd miles, fifty five miles, or something like that. And there was a a, a woman in charge of uh, bicycleways and the like at the state level, at the Department of Natural Resources, and eventually the Natural Resources bought the, the railroad bed, partially for a trail, but partially for the prairie. Uh, but they did it so slowly that by the time they did it, <coughs> 11 local sites has been bought by local adjacent owners, and so it's always been very contentious. And in the last few weeks, it's become a place where this land is looked on for its highest and best use as corn and soybeans. And very little of it is understood as, as wonderful, undisturbed, uh, relatively undisturbed uh, prairie soil and prairie uh, remnants. Uh, so the move is afoot to uh, destroy that, uh, it was called the wind prairie. And uh, that's so disappointing because here we are to uh, perhaps down to 0.1% of the prairie that was uh, left, the original prairie. This is not the, uh, counting the, the reconstruction prairies. This is basically the, that what was and what came in after glaciation and has been around for at least six and possibly in 10,000 years. Uh, and here we're going to lose a large percentage of what we have left. <coughs> uh, we're concerned. We don't know how to, to go to the farmers that would want to perhaps even save the prairie. Sometimes this happens, believe it. But uh, there's a move of the foot to lose this. It's associated with a whole bunch of other things. In the middle of this area is Amish country. So you get to know the Amish farmers. Uh, we had meetings that perhaps had 200 people at, in a restaurant that normally uh, carry 100 people at most. And the Amish people are concerned about privacy or they're being convinced to express that uh, by the farmers who may not be Amish. So, uh, you have to put twos and threes together and figure out what's going on. And uh, there are uh, other railroad beds that are also being removed. This is in the 80s. So you go from Paris to Kansas to Charleston to Mattoon to Sullivan to Decatur. And that's another railroad. But it's in the same general area. 
and uh, so sad to see that the vegetation goes. And in many cases, you can't even see where that. <coughs> Excuse me. You can't, it, <coughs> you can't even see where the railroad was. Uh, so we, I can remember going to uh, Broomcorn Festival parade. So uh, th this is where we were trying to tell people the value of this land. As, uh, so uh, uh, we uh, got to know the Monahans and the Libmans that owned Broomcorn factories. How did uh, so that you have to think about the the history of the Okor Valley, where uh, two people came to uh, the Okor Valley and they had a town called Bag Baghdad, I think it was. But anyway, the railroad came through in the fifties, and the <coughs> as with Homer and a whole bunch of other places. The frame houses were dragged across to what is now Alcola, but it wasn't Alcola at that time. It was called the Okor because it was the the uh, original town was on the Okor River, and so Chesterville is that town now, and that's kind of in the Amish community. Uh, so Alcola is a mixture of things. And somewhere in there, somebody discovered uh, broom corn. And so the, the farmers had broom corn. And it was not easy to manage it. Uh, it the broom corn is like uh, regular corn, only it's uh, a lot of fibers, more like uh, sorghum. And... Uh, you had to go through the crop at a certain time of the year and table it. You had to bend it down so that those ears uh, that were mature uh, would dry out. And then you had to go through drying and, and you made brooms out of this. And then after World War II, uh, the... During the war, women got to do this sort of work, uh, but when World War II came back, the men were not so anxious to be involved in this heavily uh, hand-organized uh, operation. So they went off to Mexico and bought broom corn from there. Sometimes it was from places like Hungary, uh, and more recently, it has been plastic that has been used rather than uh, broom corn. But that brought to our caller a bunch of Latinos from Mexico from the same district which was producing the, the uh, corn. So there in, in our caller, uh, the Amish and the Mexicans and the regular Caucasian populations that populated the, the corridors. Uh, so how do we, at this stage, which is fairly late, convince people to at least tell people about key piece, pieces of remnant prairie that could be kept? The railroad bed was like 55 miles long. They only went about 30 miles long from Oakland to Hinesboro to uh, Arcola to Chesterville to Arthur to Lovington. And so it was decapitated on either end. And some of that prairie was good too. So. We keep losing this prairie. We keep losing our our endangered ecosystem, and it's it's too bad. And uh, do we go to the the uh, nature preserves commission and and speak for three minutes and say, can we do something to preserve this? And and seriously, the 
Department of Natural Resources had been knowing that this was happening for a long time. Do we go to the farmers specifically? Did we go to the lawyers? And uh, it's very hard to find the time to do all that at once. So then you need people who are out there who know and can uh, trans translate your fairly crude statements and interpret them for local people to pick up and preserve. <coughs> you have to realize that in this melee of trying to preserve prairies, most of which are long railroad lines, we've been in a lot of places and we've lost a lot of good territory, uh, good for native plants. The, one of the most important ones was between Decatur and Peoria. And George Burrier, a lawyer in Morton, which is just across the river from Peoria, a uh, rails to trails in, East, in central Illinois. And George did a lot to, to encourage uh, that preservation. Didn't succeed, but he did get a bunch of stuff around uh, Morton. Uh, there have been some real successes. The Department of Natural Resources has one trail called the Tunnel Hill Trail in southern Illinois. And that's worked. The Chicago area, anything north of uh, Route 80, the soil is not as good. The population is there. The power and the political power and the money is there to acquire the old Hennepin Canal from uh, about Starved Rock through to, to the Quad Cities. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, very decent prairies in the Chicago area. There are retired railroad beds. There are uh, trails that are par parallel to the rail beds. But we need to, to alert people to the fact that these resources are there and that it can be worked with. So... WEFT has been very helpful in allowing us to, and encouraging us to do this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, what else can I tell you about the, there's an interesting one that, where the, the railroad bed went from Paris to Kansas to Charleston to Mattoon. And between Mattoon and uh, Charleston, there's a big hospital and Behind that hospital there's, were two railroads. There was a, I, I suspect it was an interurban parallel to the railroad line. And that has become a, a trail. Uh, and Mattoon itself has been uh, a key with, with uh, Illinois Central going through it and a, an east-west line. And they had big railroad depots there and those have been somewhat disconvolvulated and uh, Mattoon is down to a few buildings and it's lost some of its character so uh, what do we do about all this I was listening today to a commentary on Wendell Berry Wendell Berry is a farmer who's a poet and writes a little bit like Lynn Walfall locally who writes poetry about what happens on the farm and he likes to think about at least some people retaining their farm, retaining their location in a community, being part of the community. And as uh, big farms have consolidated and you've gone from perhaps 80, 80 acres to uh, 10,000 acres and you have equipment that's positively huge 
you get to be more remote. You don't get to talk to each other. You you don't climb upon that house-sized tractor and talk to the the farmer that is running the machine. And behind this there is the the uh, multinationals that own some of this stuff and own some of the concepts and the one percent that uh, is making money from it and from the GMOs that are associated and the research that goes on with GMOs and how do you uh, commercialize these operations that were often inefficient but family oriented like you might have chickens running around the yard and you might know George is the rooster and you might know that, that the, the, the hen would have a bunch of young ones and you have to protect her from the, the hawks or whatever. And now you have a chicken factory which the chickens grow much faster because they're bred to do that and they're overcrowded, and uh, the eggs, you, you try to get 365 eggs a day, a, a year, and uh, there's just a, a point where we, we need a balance between the wee folk, little folk, and the, the, uh, the more commercial situation. Uh, Let me have a look at my notes now. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I was thinking that I should say something about the pumpkin vine. The pumpkin vine is a line that branches off at Leroy from another line and comes through uh, the northern part of Champaign uh, through uh, Fisher uh, to... Uh, Rantoul to Dillsburg to Pernfield to to uh, Armstrong to uh, into Indiana and into Lafayette. Uh, many of these railroad beds, I and others have walked almost all of them, and we know where things are. The pumpkin vine has beautiful prairie on it at some places and. We've been sad to lose that to farming, but there are remnants there, and we managed to get the uh, a mile of prairie uh, preserved in the Penfield area. And then there was, how do you preserve this? Well, since about 1965, we've been working with prairie preservation We've had conferences and we've, we've had a reading the landscape course at Parkland College for many years. <coughs> and a uh, artist in the landscape course at uh, the School for the Art Institute in Chicago. And many of these things are attempts to get people to get together to uh, think about their local ecosystem. Uh, that got to a peak in about the 80s uh, when we were able to, somebody came forth to buy that uh, plot of land and we created the Grand Prairie Friends. And we were very pleased that that happened. We, we are oriented to have an organization that would be specifically for prairie. It is so much harder to preserve original prairie than it is to preserve something like a forest. So we've been pleased that the Grand Prairie Friends did that, and we we're pleased to st step aside and, and they be the specialists in that territory because uh, we have a, a, a gob of other things to do. And, and we're not as specialized, perhaps. So the, the Grand Prairie Friends has gone ahead and helped to preserve a original prairie in the Lotus Cemetery and in Watt Seeker and 
other places. But at the moment, they're not too oriented to uh, buying up all railroad beds, which is the only place where there's any really good prairie. Uh, so we may have to form a, a new organization to maintain prairie like the good prairie we have between Monticello and Cisco. Uh, and there's only a few people to go around, so how do you do this? That's, that means you. sometimes there's a royal we, and the royal we might be two, three, four, five people getting things together. And uh, it's, it, it, it's very hard to get 10 or 12 environmental groups in Champaign County to get together, let alone to get people together from Peoria to to uh, Decatur, to Danville, uh, to think about the railroad beds and, and restoration. Uh, it's, okay. Uh, so that you have to c commiserate with people who are looking at your maintenance, then you have to say, well, we've done it on a shoestring, and we haven't attended to some of these essential things. So you have to then get together people who might be able to fund you to put in a, a window or to comply with c city ordinances so that you can then go ahead and continue these activities. The other thing is you have to take these activities and the resources that have developed and transfer them to a new generation. And that, that is always a, a challenge too uh, and, and you have to know that, that the new generation will have a, a totally different idea of what to do to preserve uh, a, a prairie. You might be talking to Jack White and, and, and prairie strips, contour strips and farmland and can you uh, ask people to afford that? So. It's, there's things we can do, and we hope you are listening and you, you might contribute to the cause in one way or another. And I think that's as far as we can go today. Uh, thanks for listening. This is Dave Monk, Perry Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board, I'll give you your phone number one more time if people want to come out and help you with um, the, uh, the Freedom Parade that's That'll be the 4th of July, of course, 840-1911. As always, the views expressed here on the Prairie Monk are solely those of the speakers and no one else.